Welcome back to Mike's Monthly Mix, where we're looking at the biggest album releases from April 2022. Why, yes, I did get a haircut. What do you do once you've done it all? Jack White, for instance, he spent the 2000s as half of one of the most well-respected rock bands of his time. He helped give us my generation's defining sports anthem. His place in history is all but secure. But once you've done it all, what do you do? Following the end of the White Stripes, he struck out on his own. He worked with Beyonce. He made impassioned pleas to build vinyl manufacturing plants. And while he stayed in ruck music, he started veering into this impressionist blues rock, a different stripe for a different type, you might say. His last album, Boarding House Reach, was famous for not actually having any songs. It's true, scientists have been baffled by the lack of anything resembling a song on this album, but I'm gonna be blasphemous right now. In the years since, I've grown to respect Boarding House Reach, and while it may not have songs, the album as a whole moves in its own unique way. I'm happy to say that his new album, Fear of the Dawn, has songs. It's also not as weird as BHR. I don't think he'll eclipse that album in weirdness for a long while. If that album turned you off, this new one might be more up your alley. Though, don't get me wrong, this thing is still very weird. Jack has honed in a bit closer on this jazz, blues, noise rock genre mishmash that he first spawned on BHR, and the results are usually good. However, to use a sports metaphor, when Jack steps up to bat, sometimes he gets a home run, and sometimes he opens a pit to the hell dimension. His collab with Q-Tip, for example, Man, I really wanted to like this. Both of these musicians are talented, and their coming together could have yielded some really cool and weird stuff, but I'm bummed that the final result feels so disjointed. Much like Boarding House Reach, though, Fear of the Dawn really finds itself in the middle. The stretch from Eosophobia to Eosophobia reprise is the highlight. My favorite track from that stretch is What's the Trick? That classic distorted guitar, Jack raging about haters and coffee-colored crystals, that scream he lets out towards the end, Love it. We'll have to see how Fear of the Dawn ages compared to BHR. It's also worth noting, this isn't the only Jack White album coming out this year. He'll be releasing a second, more acoustic album in the summertime. With or without Satan's transducer on his guitar, Jack White continues to uh, carve his own path in music. And while I don't often love the results, I'm glad he's out here doing his thing. Check out What's the Trick. And by the way, that song, along with all the others I bring up, will be in a playlist for you to listen to. Links in the description. Red Hot Chili Peppers have been away since 2016, and with unlimited love, they're ready to show us the frushantes of their labor. Yes, guitarist John Frusciante returns to the band after his departure following Stadium Arcadium back in 2006. It's nice to see him back, and the whole band plays as if he had never left. If you're a fan, this is a nice reunion akin to a 73-minute long hug from a dear relative. For everyone else, it's a perfectly fine chili Pepper's album. That relative is a stranger, and I would personally not want to be hugged by a stranger for 73 minutes. Check out Aquatic Mouth Love. Is that sexual? Who am I kidding? It's Chili Peppers. Of course it's sexual. Toronto punk band Pup are unraveling, and they've made a whole album to commemorate it. These guys have always been great at supplying raucous punk rock for making you feel good about feeling bad. But it's also nice to see them weave in new touches, like synth beats and piano ballads. Give waiting a listen. Let's Eat Grandma is a resume writing platform that can... Wait, no. Let's Eat Grandma is a synth-pop duo from the UK, and they released their third album, Two Ribbons. The record before this was sonically and structurally experimental, and I ended up respecting it more than I liked it. Without a doubt, this new one hits so much quicker, and it may end up being one of the better synth-pop albums of this still young year. Check out Sunday. Pop star Camila Cabello dropped her latest album, Familia. This is the most she's moved away from her girl group roots, as it's largely focused on Latin pop. And I'll say it now, strike me down if you must. I think Camilla succeeded with this departure. Sure, there are moments where it reaches a bit too far in my opinion. That one bit in Psycho Freak where she alludes to Fifth Harmony, I, I just don't care enough about the Fifth Harmony canon for that line to work. But still, this is far and away her best solo work yet, with some excellent storytelling to boot on a track like Lola. You may not know the name Lucius, but you've definitely heard them before. They've worked with The War on Drugs, The Killers, Harry Styles. Yeah, that's right, they sing the hook on his song, Treat People with Kindness. Now they have this new record out called Second Nature. It's produced by Brandy Carlisle and Dave Cobb, and it marries their prior folk sensibilities with a shift to dance floor ditties. It's a good and well-made time, though I sometimes felt like the pacing was
was stop and go, if their next record leans more consistently into the danceable tracks, then it's game over for all of us. Check out lead single Next to Normal. Alt country singer Orville Peck returns with his second album, Bronco. Now, I didn't get to cover his first album. Side note, I'm trying to get my own language off the ground. Let me know what you think of this translation. But I like this new album a good deal more than his last. Is that because of the maturation in his musical arrangements, his clear growth as a vocalist, or that Lil Yeehaw derelict deep within my heart calling for that yonder pasture? Nah, I think it's the first two. Give all I can say a listen. The internet is a terrible place that you shouldn't be on, but it's also a nice funk band. And that band's lead singer, Sid, dropped a new solo album called Broken Hearts Club. Ah, oh, I haven't seen you at the meetings! What sets this apart from the internet's work is the clear lean into 80s synths and production. It's an easygoing way to spend 39 minutes, and if you're a fan of intimate R&B, then consider yourself a new member of this club. Give heartfelt freestyle a try. British rock duo Wet Leg released their debut self-titled album. So this is the hot new band that's been buttering everybody's muffin. Well, sorry ladies, my muffin's been buttered since 2003, and I thought your debut was fine. This kind of alt-rock isn't new, but they've got a pretty great sense of humor throughout. Also, I don't know if it was intentional, but the way the guitar on I Don't Wanna Go Out sounds like the hook from Bowie's The Man Who Sold the World. Nice touch. Check that track out. Vince Staples dropped his latest album, Ramona Park Broke My Heart. I'll give him this. He always surprises. This new record is his take on classic West Coast hip-hop production. You can close your eyes and feel the California sun on your face, even as Vince reckons with violence and his upbringing. This is the most I've enjoyed a Vince Staples project since Big Fish Theory. Check out East Point Prayer. You may know Daniel Rawson as a member of acclaimed indie rock band Grizzly Bear, and he's only just now released his debut solo album, You Belong There. Grizzly Bear had been building a solid knack for orchestration on their more recent albums, but in that way, those records pale in comparison to You Belong There. It's lush, ornate, and often spellbinding, like a gorgeous painting in a museum. That said, there were times where I felt like I was looking at the beautiful music and not actively immersed in it. If anything, it's a good reminder that Yet Again by Grizzly Bear is a song that you haven't listened to in a while and should listen to again. Check out Yet Again, I mean, Shadow in the Frame. Americana stalwart Kurt Vile released his latest record Watch My Moves. His music is perfect for long drives across large expanses and feeling the sun on your exposed retinas. While that is a compliment for this album, I really do think it's best when in the background of another activity. It's over 70 minutes long, and I don't think it justifies the length. But you know what was cool? The callback on Jesus on a Wire to 2011's Jesus Fever. Jesus Fever is another song that you should probably go listen to again soon. Check out Like Exploding Stones. Similar to that question I asked about Jack White, what do you do once you've gone as far as you can go? Father John Misty has become known as one of music's most outlandish personalities, taking his dry wit and pedantic pen to subjects ranging from love to society itself. But once you've taken on all of society, where do you go? The last time I fathered a John Misty, it was with his 2018 album, God's Favorite Customer. When I put it on my top 10 list that year, I said it was egoless. And at the time, sure, yeah. I get why I said that, but I made a grave error when I said that. I forgot that Father John Misty was still usually talking about himself. On Chloe in the next 20th century, Father John Misty doesn't talk about himself. Like, think about that for a second. The guy who had sliced his own sarcastic and wry niche in music, who once sang about betting Taylor Swift every night inside the Oculus Rift. That guy? now writes music that isn't about himself. John played the omniscient god looking down on society for pure comedy. This time, he zoomed all the way in on his supporting cast. The characters range from socialist socialites, a cat representing a dying relationship, an actress who charms Letterman, a wedding band of Nazis, and also about half of everyone on the record dies. But while Misty's lyrical approach is a departure, the overall sound of Chloe is... Also kind of a departure, but, but, but not as much of one. With I Love You Honey Bear and especially pure comedy, Misty displayed an acute sense of orchestration in his music. Chloe continues that display, but the framing is different. It's a more overt callback to big band and singer-songwriter fare from the early and mid 20th century. At first, I thought it was supposed to be sarcastic, but Nope, it's played pretty straight. The closest we get to God's favorite customer is The Closer, which busts out a damn guitar solo absolutely out of goddamn nowhere. If pure comedy sounded like you were watching John play Carnegie Hall, Chloe sounds like you accidentally stumbled upon him at a secluded jazz club. To put it another way, Chloe in the next 20th century isn't Father John Misty's sound exploding into new directions, 
it's imploding. Misty had, in my opinion, reached the logical conclusion of his style and persona, and he could either do the same thing every couple of years or so with diminishing results, or he could start fresh. Here's to the next 20th century. Check out Kiss Me, I Loved You. Hatchie released her second studio album, Giving the World Away. With her last album, the song Without a Blush was one of my favorites from 2019, but I didn't gel with the rest of the record. This new album hit me immediately, but I have trouble recommending just one track. If you're in the market for explosive indie rock, the kind that would soundtrack the best 90s teen rom-com never made, then I think you'll really like this. Give This Enchanted a try. UK indie rock band Block Party dropped their sixth album, Alpha Games. I'm about to say a sentence that no one has ever said before. I love Block Party's debut album and have mixed feelings on every album that followed. Yes, I will take my award. But this new album sounds a good deal like Silent Alarm, and I like it for that. Even the synths on here are tastefully used. A far cry from that one synth on I recommend If We Get Caught. Legendary rock band Spiritualized released their ninth album, Everything Was Beautiful. This makes for a nice companion to their 2018 release, And Nothing Hurt. Though I feel like the titles may have been reversed, And Nothing Hurt was a beautiful sounding album, and Everything Was Beautiful is more likely to rock so hard that it does hurt. Regardless, it's another great spiritualized album, and I'm still barred from my local Walmart. Check out Best Thing You Never Had. Irish post-punk band Fontaine's DC dropped their third album, Skinty Fia. Now, personally, there's always one post-punk album every year that I just can't get into, and usually it's made by a British band. However, Fontaine's DC separate themselves from that curse, not just with the Isle of Man, but with an album that I'll get many listens out of, man. La, 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 la. This is everything I could want out of post-punk. Claustrophobic yet catchy guitars, a deep emotional core, and a great sense for dynamic builds. I really enjoyed Roman Holiday. Help me out here. Swedish House Mafia are actually back, not to get too old man here, but I remember my senior year of high school being consumed by Don't You Worry Child, their supposed final single. Fast forward a decade, and they're fully back with their debut album of sedated electropop with features from Ty Dolla Sign and The Weeknd? Do I have that right? Okay, cool, because it's a little too long, but I'm into it. Give Moth to a Flame a listen. Brooklyn's own Fivio Foreign has this new record out, Bible. You might remember Fivio from his verse on Kanye West's Donda. That was a good verse, and this is a pretty alright record. There are probably better drill records out there, but for anyone who's even a modest fan of the genre, you'll have a good time with this. I think I'm legally required to like What's My Name, which samples Say My Name by Destiny's Child. <laughs> Confidence Man? Ooh, yes, Australian dance pop duo Confidence Man. They followed up their stellar debut album with Tilt, and it's... Hmm. If I had to pin it on something, it's that this feels less fun. A lot of the humor and playfulness of their debut isn't here. What's left is still good dance music, and if you want that, then you'll get it. I'm just not loving it this time, but I'm still excited for whatever they do. Check out Feels Like a Different Thing. Banks dropped her fourth album, Serpentina. If you're looking for a dose of tender alt-pop, this will satisfy it. However, there are moments here where the sound goes much bigger, and it gets close to genuine greatness. I wish there were more moments like that on the record. I very much enjoyed holding back. Rapper Pusha T has a new album out. It's mostly produced by Kanye West, and Pharrell Williams. What do you think of this translation? Yeah, this thing is excellent. Production is constantly surprising, and Pusha T remains as great as ever at wordplay and storytelling centered around powdered sugar and Ziplocs. Check out Let the Smokers Shine the Coops. Brazilian pop star Anita released her fifth studio album, Versions of Me. Now I'll be up front. I thought this was a good time. I enjoyed Anita as a vocalist, and the production kept my attention as it shifted between today's American pop sound and Brazilian pop. That said, I've seen many in the discourse void who are more familiar with Brazilian music saying that this is a very watered down representation. If Anita's goal was to pander to a stupid American like me, then she found her target audience. You may not like it, but this is what culture looks like. But if you're more familiar with this genre, you may be less impressed. It's telling that my favorite song, the title track, is pretty much devoid of Brazilian influence. Oh, this new Red Veil! He's a young rapper and producer, became known in 2020, and he's back with a new album, Learn to Swim. The star here is the production. If the light soul touches from recent Tyler and Earl records perked your ear up, that ear is gonna shoot to the moon with this album. Check out the closer working on it. The Linda Lindas dropped their debut album, Growing Up. If that name sounds familiar, it's because they were the band that went viral in early 2020, performing in a library. Usually that's not the recipe for a quality album, but my inability to read strikes me again. This is a delightful pop punk album, recommended for fans of Best Coast, The Beths, or Early Weezer. Check out the song that started it all, Racist, Sexist, Boy. And to close out the roundup, Future's back from his two-year break with his new album, I Never Liked You. 
This could be very easy. Nah, just kidding. It's fine. Not a major departure from Future's usual trap sound, which I was low-key expecting considering the two-year break before this album. For him, that's long. He had released at least one project every year between 2014 and 2020. But this is still the most I've enjoyed a Future album since... Hendrix? Give Holy Ghost a listen. <laughs> Well, 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 look who came crawling back after one month. It was only recently that I finally dived into the immense catalog of Australian rockers King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. Their first record dropped in 2012, and they've since made 20 albums that span across the wide gamut of psych rock. Now you might ask, why do a deep dive of the Discog Persuasion if they're just gonna make it outdated in a year? I don't know, blame democracy! And they have made it a wee bit outdated. They were gonna release a new album in December 2021 with a festival, but both of those were delayed because of COVID, except now that record is a vinyl-only release, and I don't listen to anything that doesn't spin at 500 RPM at the center. But after that, they announced another album, their 20th! Omnium Gatherum. The first tease of this record was the 18-minute opening track, The Dripping Tap. The song harkens back to the band's early epic openers, like Head on Pill and the Mind Fuzz Suite. It is spectacular. There's also an entire album after it. Or actually, I should correct myself. There's two albums after it. Coming in at 80 minutes long, this is KG's longest album by far. And in interviews, guitarist Stu McKenzie framed it as their white album. Does Omnium Gatherum earn its length? Uh, uh, yeah, mostly. If you're already acquainted with King Glizzy's work, here's my take. About half of the record is oddments, and the other half is infest the rat's nest. If you don't know what any of those words mean, well, first of Glizzy is slang for a hot dog. What I mean is, you can split Omnium Gatherum roughly between fuzzy melodic psych pop and blown out doom metal. These are two aesthetics that I didn't expect to see from KG again, let alone on the same album. But it gives the record a unique and unpredictable pace. It's like a big buffet where half of the food is Greek and half of it is slabs of concrete. But even as they tread familiar ground, KG bring a couple of new tricks up their collective sleeve. For example, Rapping. There's straight up rapping on the Grim Reaper and Sadie Sorceress. The latter is eerily close to a 90s rap track. All it's missing is a run DMC feature. On that same note, to any up and coming producers out there, Kepler 22B would make a phenomenal sample. Just saying. And there are a few sprinkles of jazz keys across the project, like on Presumptuous. I think it'll take time to see where Omnium Gatherum lands in the great King Gizzard pantheon, but it's clear they have not lost their ability to subvert and surprise. Check out the dripping tap. So if I had to recommend three albums from this month that I think you should listen to, I would say Father John Misty's Chloe in the Next 20th Century, Pusha T's It's Almost Dry, and Orville Peck's Bronco. Why not? And if you have any thoughts on the records that I covered, or if there's one you want me to check out for next time, let me know in the comments.